when I think about the situation that has developed and has now brought us to the sort of polemics that were characteristic of the Cold War uh, since the Ukrainian crisis burst upon us a little over a year ago, I'm very much reminded of some of the comments uh, that Senator Fulbright made at the time of the war in Vietnam. Let me say that personally at that time, I was of a different opinion. I was a supporter of the Vietnam War because I thought we had a duty to those from North Vietnam that had fled to the South uh, with our help and that we needed their support. They needed our support. Of course, it turned out that our support was insufficient. And at the time, Fulbright understood that. And he made a couple of very important comments around 1966 that I think are relevant today. And I want to take them sort of as a text as I talk about what I think was a misunderstanding of power in the world on both sides, or you might say all three sides of this problem with Ukraine, the three sides being Russia on the one hand, US, NATO, and the EU on the other, and of course, Ukrainians. Um, I think there has been a real misunderstanding of how power is used and effective power. But so let me quote just two of the things that Fulbright said in 1966. One, he was obviously thinking of Lord Acton's um, saying about power tends to corrupt when he said power tends to confuse itself with virtue. Power tends also to take itself for omnipotence. Once imbued with the idea of a mission, a great nation easily assumes that it has the means as well as the duty to do God's work. Now, I think on, if we're looking both at the Western, US and Western attitude toward Ukraine and the Russian attitude, you can to see both sides think they have a mission, whether they consider it God's mission or not, that there is a mission. The, the West to support democracy and to enforce international law. In the case of Russia, to support the well-being of the Russian people uh, from incursions abroad and the security of their own security. The other quotation I want to take before I talk about that issue in general is also from the same year uh, when Senator Fulbright said, uh, the cause of our difficulties, that is the United States, and in this case in Southeast Asia, is not a deficiency of power, but an exercise of the wrong kind of power, which results in a feeling of impotence when it fails to achieve its desired ends. We are trying to remake Vietnam's, Vietnamese society, a task we uh, certainly cannot be accomplished by force and most probably cannot be accomplished by any means available to outsiders. Well, doesn't that really describe what Russia is trying to do in Ukraine? Uh, trying to force Ukraine to a different constitutional arrangement, and yet uh, most likely they're not going to be able to do so by force. We see there a tragic situation, and one which now has given rise to the sort of polemics that were characteristic uh, during the Cold War. We have almost the same sort of rhetoric going on back and forth on the two sides. And what strikes me, however, when people compare it to the Cold War is this is entirely different. After all, the Cold War was a confrontation 
over, uh, over the entire world, over basically different philosophical positions as to the role of government. And the confrontations were worldwide. Now this confrontation is over a fairly small area, as, as important as it is, vitally important to the people involved, and over an area which 30 years ago would have been simply an internal matter of the Soviet Union, not even a matter of international concern other than from the humanitarian standpoint. So how does that suddenly become into an east-west confrontation uh, that we are seeing today? Now, the, it seems to me that the stakes are so different that one has to go back and think about, well, aren't we forgetting something? or perhaps misunderstanding something. And it seems to me that both we, and speaking of uh, those of us in the West, and the Russians are misinterpreting what happened during the Cold War and particularly how it was ended. We are misinterpreting it, and we are particularly misinterpreting the role of power in bringing about those results. After all, in 1992, we were thinking the Cold War was over, Europe was united, the Iron Curtain was down, the countries in Eastern Europe were free. We had, we thought, achieved something that was the goal both of Gorbachev's Soviet Union in its last years and of uh, NATO and the West, a Europe whole and free. And now we are down talking as if Europe is again divided and, and that uh, the stakes are almost the same as those during the Cold War with military maneuvers on both sides and reminders occasionally from the Russian side that we are still a nuclear power. You know, that is the real danger right now if we let this get out of hand and if we let this thinking continue in mind. Because I'll tell you, as one who was intimately involved in several decades of trying to end the nuclear arms race, our, my grandchildren don't want to see another one because it is not a pleasant thing to have to deal with. So let's begin to try to think about how did we end the Cold War and why are we getting things wrong? There are really three things happened in the late 1980s and the very beginning of the 1990s. Three things that were connected, but were quite different. One of them was the end of the Cold War. Was that a defeat for the Soviet Union? No. We negotiated an end in the interest of both sides and in everybody else's interest, because it was peaceful, it met everybody's needs. And then the second thing that happened that I consider a geopolitically seismic in the sense that you know, continents are moving around uh, in a geopolitical sense. The second thing was that communist rule in the Soviet Union was ended as an effective rule. Was that done as a pressure of the West or as a condition to end the Cold War? Absolutely not. It was done under Gorbachev's leadership because it was something the country needed to be done to free them up from that. And it happened that as the leader of the Communist Party, he was probably the only person who could have done it, given the structure of that. Having removed the Communist Party from control of the Soviet Union, then the contradictions within the Soviet Union forced the country apart. The third thing, the end of the Soviet Union as a unitary state. 
That was not the end of the Cold War. And yet, many people in the West look at it as the end of the Cold War and as if we ended the Cold War in a victory. We won the Cold War. Look, we all won the Cold War. We negotiated an end. The end of the Soviet Union was brought about from forces within the Soviet Union. The American government, the British government, most of our Western allies did not want the Soviet Union to break up. President Bush, our first President Bush, gave a speech in Kiev August 1st, 1991, when they were discussing a union treaty um, to keep the republics of the Soviet Union together, all except the three Baltic countries. And Bush recommended to the Ukrainians to sign the Union Treaty. You could say, why didn't we want the Soviet Union to break up? Well, there were two big reasons. One, we didn't want to see a multiplicity of nuclear powers in the world. And two, we could see that the reforms that were going on in the Soviet Union were being pushed by Moscow. And if you break it up at this time, except for the three Baltic countries, which had already been moving very rapidly to a democracy, you were, in most of them, going to have retrogression. Now, of course, the myth in the, West, in, in the West is we won the Cold War, and then, having been talking about we won the Cold War, we began to treat Russia as a defeated country, <clears throat> which meant that increasingly, seeing uh, these actions, Russians say, well, we must have lost the Cold War, and and it was the West who broke up the Soviet Union. They said they won. They broke up the Soviet Union. Uh, they're out to get us. Uh, they're enemies. And you get two completely incompatible narratives about what happened during and after the Cold War on both sides, both wrong. Because what we're hearing now, you know, in Moscow is that... Uh, uh, it, uh, the United States and its allies deceived Gorbachev uh, and broke up the Soviet Union in order to establish an American empire, American dominance throughout the world. Well, what evidence do they use for that? Well, after talking about a Europe whole and free and also assuring Gorbachev that if a united Germany would stay in NATO, there would be no expansion of NATO jurisdiction to the east. That was not a treaty commitment. It was not a formal promise. It was certainly the diplomatic atmosphere of those negotiations. And none of us, frankly, in 1990, at the time Germany unified and we had a treaty, could imagine that there would be any reason to expand NATO to the east because we were thinking of building a security structure which would include Russia and Eastern Europe. How else can you have a Europe whole and free? Well, subsequent governments thought differently, but not because, as now the Russians claim, we wanted to get at Russia, but because of demands of the East Europeans. So what you had in the late 90s and then in the first decade of the 21st century was actions on the West, which I would say at the mildest were inconsiderate, and some, I would say, in the case of, of Russia, downright offensive, but a Russian overreaction, which often made the matters worse. And you get sort of a malign type of vibration that begins to shake the relationship. So it was not just the beginning of NATO expansion to the east, but the bombing of Serbia over Kosovo, done without UN approval, uh, 
And that broke a commitment to the UN because you're not supposed to attack another country unless it has attacked you. Serbia had not attacked any NATO member. Now, there was a real human rights issue there. And then, of course, later, you had such things as the United States pulling out of the ABM Treaty, which we had a right to do, but was a stupid thing to do because it was really the basis of our dealings earlier with the Soviet Union and then would have been with Russia regarding these nuclear issues. Something we seem to have forgotten once the Cold War was over and we calmed this nuclear arms race is that you remain there are two preeminent nuclear powers, even with all that we have cut, and that's the United States and Russia. And then, on the background of all of this, we had all of the talk of a sole superpower. There were two superpowers before, now there's only one, the United States. And a superpower, by definition, can do anything, apparently. It's a meaningless term, and that's the reason I said I want to talk about power. It gets back to the very thing Senator Fulbright was talking about. Yes, the United States had the predominant military power in the world. What can you do with military power? Can you reform other societies? Can you create democracy for them? No. And if it's just a matter of destructiveness, Russia was a superpower too. But the whole problem at the, from the end of the 20th century into the 21st is that the whole nature of power was changing. And not just in terms that different countries gain or lose power, and not just because there are many types of power other than military power, some of which can do positive things, uh, much better than the military. You have hard power, economic power, and what Professor Nye has called a soft power. Uh, and it's really the soft power that does most of the positive creation uh, uh, of, uh, of use of influence. But another thing was happening, and that is the power of governments was being diluted. It was no longer as nearly as complete. I suppose it was never absolute complete. But increasingly, what's happening in the world, the power is exercised not only by governments, but by international organizations, by private uh, citizens, by Think of the power uh, of terrorist organizations, uh, the power of organized crime, uh, uh, the power, uh, in many ways, of, of organized people who are trying to push a given cause. So uh, power is not something that is simply separatized or polarized. And yet, by our actions, then, first of all, the talk of we won the Cold War and then acting as if, well, Russia is weak now. We don't have to consider their interests. We'll go ahead, and if we have a good reason otherwise, we just do what we need, need to do. Then you really do leave an impression with the Russian people that you are cutting them out of decision making. And if you are the only superpower and people have a problem, Either you're supposed to come and solve it for them, and if you don't, you're probably an enemy. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And that has been the position that often the United States, and increasingly NATO, has almost, you might say, created for itself by this pattern of, of uh, not paying full attention uh, to uh, the uh, views of others. Now, in this world of diffuse power, and in this world where increasingly the problems, the serious problems we face, are international, they are transcendental. 
what, you know, what are my grandchildren going to be particularly dealing with? My children are already getting pretty close to retirement age. Uh, but, and that is issues such as the global warming and the deterioration of our environment. Issues such as international crime, the spread of disease, maybe new diseases, corruption, which is increasingly international. Think of the FIFA uh, now and so on. Uh, one could name these serious problems and not one of them can be solved without very extensive international cooperation. It's not something one government or even one group of people, of, uh, uh, of governments can take on without having the cooperation of at least the major countries. And I think the recognition of that means, and this is again, I can go back to some of the comments that Senator Fulbright made earlier, but more recently, I think uh, our prof uh, professor Joseph Nye has pointed out that effective power today really means integrating your efforts with those of others, finding a common interest, and then working with them for it. And you know, thinking back, that is precisely what we managed to do to end the Cold War. In 1983, I was living a very good and pleasant life as American ambassador in Prague. And I was asked to come to the White House and take a job. And at first I said, no, no I don't want to go back to Washington. I, that bureaucracy is terrible. <laughs> I'd much rather live here in my palace in Prague. <laughs> and, <laughs> but I was called back. And I, this was 83, and I was told that uh, President Reagan had decided it was time to deal with the Soviet leaders and that uh, nobody in the White House then had much experience dealing with them. And they said, it's time uh, to negotiate. Uh, your job will be to develop a negotiating plan. Well, I called Rebecca in Prague and said, I'm afraid we're going to have to go to Washington. I can't turn this one down. The Cold War was at its rhetorical height. What do you do? Well, within a few months, we had President Reagan, because he asked for it, uh, do a new speech sort of dealing with the Soviet Union. And what we did there, and, or with his guidance, was to put every problem we had in terms of to cooperate for an end that was to the benefit of both countries. I think that speech, which he delivered in January uh, 1984, a little over a year before Gorbachev became general secretary, used the word cooperation something like 33 or 34 times in one speech. But what we did was try to define something that would be in the interests of both countries and saying, let's cooperate to do it. We put them in four categories. One of them was to reduce arms, particularly the nuclear weapons. Second uh, was to withdraw from conflict in third areas. Third, to cooperate to improve respect for human rights. We didn't say, you got to improve respect. Let's cooperate. And finally, we knew you had to bring down the Iron Curtain, but you don't put it that way. We say, let's develop a better working relationship. And, you know, it took us maybe three years, and, and Gorbachev, a different Soviet leader, but those, that was precisely the agenda and the approach we used. And that's why I say when we negotiated, both sides were convinced that every agreement we made was in the interests of both sides, and they were. Now, 
One of the things, as we went into those negotiations, uh, President Reagan wrote out his thoughts before he first met with Gorbachev. And there were several interesting things in there. One of them was, whatever we achieve, we must not call it victory. And Ronald Reagan never said we won the Cold War. He said in his memoirs when he parted with Gorbachev in their last meeting when he was president, we parted as partners to make a better world. The second thing he said was, we're much too upfront regarding human rights. If we hammer at them on human rights in public, we'll get a lot of cheers from the bleachers, but it won't help the victims. We must deal with that privately. And we did. And we got many things changed without making a lot of publicity over it. Well, compare that with things like the Magnitsky Act, which was passed a few years ago, an act by the US Congress dealing with a court case in Moscow, which had no American interest whatsoever. Yes, it was a scandal. Shouldn't have happened. But it was not under American jurisdiction. And so you have you know, the US Congress actually passing legislation dealing with Russia over matters which are under Russian jurisdiction. Nothing could be more insulting. Now, what do you get in return? Well, the Duma passing laws, which actually uh, prohibiting Americans from adopting orphans in Russia. I mean, OK, they were hurting themselves. But you know, this public beating on other countries, either regarding the procedures of democracy or human rights, is not something other governments should do. Obviously, human rights are important. But it's something you, if you wish to be effective and help people, you don't put the other, you know, one government doesn't put the other government publicly on the spot. Because this becomes a matter of really uh, interfering in their internal affairs. So a combination of these things, as I've said, were read by very much of the Russian public as simply insulting, putting them down, and made it very easy for the pres uh, Russian president to uh, pose as simply a defender of Russian interests. A couple of words. One shouldn't really talk about Ukraine without saying a few things about Ukraine itself. You know, Ukraine's problem, basic problem, is it is deeply divided. I went there with a group in the mid-90s to describe how our National Security Council works in the White House. And when we described our procedures, the answer was, well, you're talking about foreign policy. With us, the main security issue is not foreign policy. It is our internal division. And they showed us a slide of the vote in the last presidential election, a vote which, by the way, uh, continued almost precisely going one way or the other slightly for every election after that, except the most recent one. And you know, it showed one candidate getting close to 90% of the vote at one end, and the other candidate getting close to 90% of the vote at the other end, and some gradation in between, but a very clear split. And at the same time, it was a country which did not have a federated constitution. So somebody, any president winning that election, 50% plus one, and most of them got only slightly over 50%, would name all of the governors. And it was sort of a winner take all. And furthermore, you know, the country was one in which the uh, the people uh, were, at the same time, subject to many of the problems 
that all of the ex-Soviet republics had. After all, they were throwing off a communist system and yet developing a system which uh, was hardly uh, a fair economic system. They had their oligarchs, as did Russia, and the amount of corruption continued very high, maybe even higher than Russia. Now, the people began to object to this, particularly the corruption, and you had what they call the Orange Revolution. People honestly and very rightly objecting to the excesses of their government. Now, our NGOs and others got very actively involved in a way that the Russians could later say, hey, you stirred this up. That's absolutely unfair. It was genuine, as was the latest Maidan. Absolutely, they were against a very corrupt Ukrainian government. But you know, when you have these internal revolutions, it is not a good idea for foreigners to get directly involved. Certainly, we Americans wouldn't allow foreigners to get involved. I often say, you know, the Occupy Wall Street people, you know, <laughs> would they have been helped if you had had Chinese or Russians or others out encouraging them? It would be the kiss of death. And though what we have done by that involvement in these perfectly, I would say, per perfectly legitimate protests and, and protests that were Ukrainian against very real problems. The Russians will look at it and say, look, this is all just a CIA plot. And particularly when you have an assistant secretary of state who's out handing out cup, uh, cookies and talking on the cell phone about who should be the next prime minister. Uh, so this leaves an impression, and it left an impression for the... Uh, it, it, it left a sufficient impression that... Russian propaganda can pick this up and say, you know, the U.S. is simply trying to occupy Ukraine and use it in an anti-Russian way. So, although that is absolutely incorrect, we have gotten ourselves in a position that if the United States in particular tries to directly deal with human rights issues, or these other issues, it's going to be taken as a security threat to Russia. And I, I have asked Russians who are very disturbed with the development of a more, uh, the increasing development of a authoritarian and regime, not yet quite totalitarian, but in, in Russia, saying, look, is there something we Americans can do to help? And the answer was, stay out of it. Because when you're seen trying to help, it's simply you get a reaction, a national reaction. So the problem we face today is that Russia, in fact, has violated international law has broken agreements, and yet at the same time, the atmosphere has been such that the Russian president has been able to increase his popularity at home by doing so. So I think we have to ask ourselves, is, is this what we want? Because it is certainly not our fault that he's doing these things. The things he is doing are not in Russia's interest. They're going to be very damaging to Russia in the long run. On the other hand, uh, when we start doing economic sanctions, they're not enough to have him back down, but it's enough to convince the Russian people 
that the problems that were caused by their own action are actually caused by a hostile West. And that's the problem and the dilemma. So it seems to me that we, we do need to find a way to get back to consultation. And at first, it has to be very private to say, how can we all cooperate to help the Ukrainians put their country back together in a way which they can live peacefully and harmoniously with Russia, which is absolutely, if you look at the map and you know history, that's the only way you're going to have a normal Ukraine. Uh, and instead of making this an east-west issue, we have to get back to a sense of finding a way uh, to cooperate. Uh, and it, it won't be easy. Uh, and I'm certainly not blaming the current situation on the West. I think that the failure to manage the relationship better with Russia has created conditions which has made it possible for the Russian president to gain popularity in Russia by doing the things he's doing. That doesn't mean they're good or they should or legal or anything else. But at the same time, uh, we do need to recognize these realities. I think the overall fact is that the future of Europe and indeed of mankind will not be determined by geopolitical competi competition for control of territory. That's really what this is all about. The most serious challenges, as I have already pointed out, transcend national boundaries and could be managed to overcome only by international cooperation. And let us hope that both the Russian and Western governments will not persist in a futile effort to do for Ukraine what only Ukrainians can do for themselves. Confrontation and competition with Russia for control of Ukraine will fail, with Ukraine itself the greatest victim. A way must be found to help the Ukrainians and the Russians to find a way to live in harmony and to cope with the negative features of their common Soviet heritage. Something we have to remember, the common heritage they had of the Soviet Union has created many of these problems. And uh, we need to be sympathetic in efforts to overcome them. Thank you very much.